Good. Well, good to see everyone today. <coughs> a beautiful day. It's a special, uh, very special Shabbat today for a lot of reasons. Um, we have five people planning to be immersed today, and I'm just so thrilled about that. We have uh, Aviva and Andrew and Elizabeth and Anna and Quintina are going to be immersed today. Yeah, it's really, really exciting. So we'll be, um, we'll be headed over there at 2 o'clock. We'll have Oneg outside in the tent because it's just a lovely day. And um, then we'll head over there. We'll leave here right at 2. We'll try to really be on time because some folks, I think, are joining us there at 2.15. Go to Houghton Pond. It's going to be lovely. It's such a joy for Ruach Israel. And I, it's such a joy in the kingdom of heaven. I just think it's like the angels rejoice, you know, with us. And what a wonderful blessing. Uh, it really does. It really is. It's one of the, one of the most amazing things that we can do. Um, and then... Stick around, go home, take a nap if you live close, come over our house if you need to, and we have Slikot services at 7.30 in the evening. And uh, Slikot is a time of preparatory prayers for the High Holy Day. It's a way to kind of deeply, it's a reflective service, enter into what God is doing this season. Um, I, I think that Slikot is, is important because... The high holidays can kind of creep up on us. You know, it's like we get, we have a busy summer, at least we do. We're traveling, we're doing all this stuff. We come and everything starts all at once in the fall. And then we have the high holy days. And we've got all these days to take off from work and to stop and to be slow. You know, it's like, how does all this fit in? I don't know. Uh, and so it's a way to kind of uh, step back. And I think that we can kind of just let these things slip by, almost by accident. But I think we might miss something that is important that God is doing in our community, in our lives, as a people. And I think that what we would miss is something that we desperately need today. We're in an age of uncertainty. We're in an age where things swirl around, where God's plans get left behind in the world and we need to stay focused on what He is all about in the kingdom of heaven. So what I want to do today is share a message. I love to do this right as we move into the High Holy Days every year about the High Holy Days and outline the High Holy Days and what they're about and the whole drama that uh, we're about to participate in. Now, I think because there's so many services, if you look on the card out there, you'll see, you know, we've got Sukkot, we've got Erev Rosh Hashanah, we have Rosh Hashanah morning, we have Rosh Hashanah day two, we have Erev Yom Kippur, we have Yom Kippur, then we move into, you know, Sukkot, and then we have Simchat Torah. I mean, it's like so many different times. I think that sometimes it can feel like these are like a la carte, like options, you know, to choose from. Like, I think I'll do this one because it fits my schedule, and maybe I'll do this one and sometimes it would seem like that. It's just a repeat, the 9 o'clock service or the 11 o'clock service. Let's choose which, which one it is. But it isn't that way with the High Holy Days. They're created as a framework for a beautiful journey. And they tell a story from beginning to end. Think of it like um, uh, a, a juice cleanse. Have any of you guys ever done one of those like special cleanses? You know what I mean? Um, maybe it's 10 days of veggies and nuts. You know, intense green fiber drinks. Uh, if you're Ken, it's, it's no grains, no sugars, no fruits, no vegetables. He eats steam. You know what I mean? He, he just... <laughs> and unless you're at our house, and then you eat everything, you know? <laughs> right. But you go into these things, you know, it's like you don't know what to expect. You don't know what you're going to get out of it. And then you know you're going to have these cravings for ice cream, pizza, and cheesecake, and all this stuff. And you'll have times when you're miserable. And you go into it because you want something at the end. You want to uh, lose 20 pounds or 40 pounds or whatever. You want to lose toxins. You want to increase your immune system. You want to get healthier in some untangible way that you, you might recognize 20 years from now or something like that. And these are all good things. But these things only work if you really do them. You know what I mean? They only work if you enter into it. You only feel different, you know, if you, if you step in, but if you, if you just give in to the cheesecake too many times, or we have Ken over the house too many times, like, you know, <laughs> you come out the same as you went in, you know, and you won't feel any different, and I don't know, maybe it's a connection, the high holidays are kind of like that. If life stays the same through the season, except for, hey, let's go to the, the 10 o'clock service over here, and, you know, to check the box off or something like that, then I think you miss the cleanse. 
And you might miss the subtle ways that God is using these times that He's carefully, so carefully laid out in the Torah, so carefully laid out for us in the Bible. They're very, very clear, very organized, repeated many, many times. And I wonder, why does God make such a big deal of these things? I mean, there's chapters devoted to these times and these seasons in the Torah. The high holy days are not like an afterthought. You know, it's like, ah, here's a suggestion, a nice idea, you know, do this. It's not like that. It's, they're, they're, they're not intended for uh, ancient people long past in old days, you know. Um, he, he actually tells us to, it's like a, drop everything on these days. Do no work on these days. These are a Shabbat day for me, set aside for me. Why? Why is this so important? Why does he do this? I don't know. There, there's a lot of different reasons. Maybe there are opportunities to worship. There are opportunities to bring, uh, to be visibly distant, different from the other peoples of the world out there. You know, we do the, this is what we do. This is our life. This is how we come together. They require us to come together as a community when otherwise we wouldn't in this busy time of year. And, and even for ancient peoples, it was very busy at the harvest. I mean, this was the busiest time of year for them. These are times that are appointed to pull us away from the distractions of the world, to help us to trust Him more, to help you to draw nearer to His life, to draw you closer to community, closer to the most important people and the more important values of life. Maybe it's like a biblically mandated spiritual retreat once a year. You know, it's like, go off and do this. Sukkot is kind of like that. Perhaps uh, it's to shape and guide us in these ways, like the, like the health cleanse, like to guide us in ways we might not notice right away, but it changes who we become year after year after year to align ourselves with God's story, and we're different 10 years from today than we would have been otherwise. These are times to reflect. These are times to go inward, times for sanctification, times for healing, and times for focusing on what's most important in life. There's a neat idea that the high holy days are intended to make an invisible story visible. So that it's intended to make something invisible visible. They remind us of greater truths. They point us toward these unseen spiritual drama, if you will. It reminds us of what God is doing behind the scenes of our lives things that we might not pick up on. There's a whole spiritual world going on around us that we might not even be aware of, a plan that God is working that we're a small part of, an important part of, and yet one part of a much bigger picture. He's doing things all around the globe and all throughout history. And so what he's doing is, is he wants us to step into his life and his purposes for the world and the reality of what he has for us as a community. These are community days as well. And so just think for a moment, if you were to think of the upcoming High Holy Days as if God were saying to you, I want you to renew your relationship with me. I want you to be close with me again. I want you to feel my joy. I want you to enter into my life. I want you to enter into what I'm doing in your community, what I'm doing in the world and in my people. So let's let that be sort of a backdrop, and I'll walk through what these days are, what they, what they look like. We begin with the month of Elul. We're in the month of Elul right now. Elul is the month that leads up to the High Holy Days, and in our tradition, it's that this is the space where we prepare our hearts. This is the space where we enter into a time of reflection and processing and thinking. Ordinarily, the shofar isn't blown at all throughout the year outside of the High Holy Days. But once we begin Elul in traditional settings, we blow the shofar once every morning, all the way through, leading up to Rosh Hashanah. And I think that that's because the, the purpose of the month of Elul is to help us to break free from our routines, to step out, make something different, to stir up our spiritual insides, you know, like a detox or something like that. It's to stir everything up, to wake us up. And, you know, think of the shofar, shofar cry, when it's, when it's loud, and it's really loud, and, and, it's, and it shakes the room. It's supposed to tug at our souls. It's supposed to shake us and to wake us up from a spiritual sleepiness. Now, this week, I have the shofar at home because I have to get in shape because I, I can't do Rosh Hashanah and the 100 blasts 
uh, without like practicing a lot because everything swells up and it doesn't work. So it's great because I have the shofar at home and I've been waking the kids up with a hundred blasts on the shofar. <laughs> I stand at the bottom of the stairs, you know, and I say afterwards, wake up, it's prayer and Bible time because that's what we do the first thing of, of the day. And, and that's what the shofar is. It's a wake-up call to the Lord, you know. Tura, wake up. The Lord is king. Wake up. Live your life for him. So Elul is a season. It's a season to examine your relationship with God. Examine your relationship with people. To reflect on choices that you've made in life. The path that you're on. Where are you headed? Your priorities. Some years, I like to use this as a time to reassess my vision statements and life values and goals and kind of take a look at where things are headed and check things off and move on to the next things that God has for me. Am I living out of my deepest convictions that God has given me to live out of? And how are these shaping and refining me in this season? What are the things that you, Lord, are doing in my soul in this season how do I need to make teshuva? How do I need to repent? How do I need to get back on track? How can I be a better rabbi? How can I be a better husband, a better dad? How can I grow in all of the relationships that you've given me? And so this is what our Shlikot service is about. It's about this deep time of reflection. Traditionally, Shlikot is actually a midnight service. We, we just uh, haven't been able to stay up that late these days, so... <laughs> We're doing it at 7.30, but traditionally it's this like midnight, um, you know, kind of reflection in the depths of our soul. I think that the key to the whole high holiday season is time. If you just blur through it, then you'll run right through it. But if you can stop and listen, if you can spend time in prayer, time listening in stillness, allow the ruach to begin to tug at your soul, then you might sense the season that you're in. And you might sense that he's doing something new in this season. We move into Rosh Hashanah. Next Sunday night, we have Erev Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the, the day of the shofar in the Torah. Rosh Hashanah is a holy moment. It's like a moment in time. It's a day of awakening. So Jews all over the world take off work. The Torah uh, gives us a requirement to stop life. Really, stop life. Come together, no matter what's going on, and hear the cry of the shofar, calling us as, as individuals, as a community, as a nation, around the world, to look to God as king. You know, you think of uh, sometimes people do like International Day of Prayer, where everyone comes together to pray. Well, it's already in the scriptures. It's Rosh Hashanah, come together. You know, we come together to do this. So, so we have the hundred blasts of the shofar. Now, the tradition holds on Rosh Hashanah that there are two scrolls. There's a book of life, and then there's a book of death. At the close of Yom Kippur, your name is written on one of those two books, and your destiny is sealed. Rosh Hashanah, they open. Yom Kippur, they close. That's the drama. Now, if we thought that this was actually true, I mean, just think about it for a moment. If you really thought that, like, you know, if the world, everyone around us thought that the world was going to, I mean, Yom Kippur is it. That's it. What, what would you do? You know, we'd have a line down Greendale Avenue of cars, you know, in the parking lot to work on this or something like that. Um, now, here's the thing. I don't know to what extent our fate is sealed on these days as a people. I'm speaking as a people here. But I see it more like God asking us to act out a drama like we're acting out a play, but one that's very, very real. Because there really is a book of life. And there really is a book of death. There's a real day of reckoning that is coming for the world and coming for everyone. We can't avoid it. Yeshua tells a parable about ten young women waiting for the bridegroom. Five took lamps with no oil, and the other took five lamps with oil. When the bridegroom comes, those who are unprepared are left behind because they can't find oil for their lamps. Or like the story of the servants keeping watch over the house while the master is away. The one who are not vigil, they're surprised by the thief. And Yeshua says, so you must be ready lest the Son of Man comes when you least expect it. 
So these are all parables speaking to those deeper truths. What's happening behind the scenes while we go through our lives. So in this high holy day drama on Rosh Hashanah, here's what happens. The bridegroom shows up. We welcome him with the shofar. So we ask, are you caught ready and waiting or are you the one without the oil? We don't know the day or the hour. Are you prepared? Now, on Rosh Hashanah, God is proclaimed king. The book of life is open. Then we move into this kind of mysterious 10-day period before Yom Kippur. Our tradition has called this time the days of awe because they wonder, why are there these 10 days of stillness before Yom Kippur happens in our high holy day drama? And the tradition that we've had over centuries and centuries determined that this mysterious, let's call it a pause, might be a good time to be intentional about making things right with God, making things right with people in your lives. Because it's true, you, you can't really fully make things right with God if you can't make things right with people. But life with Yeshua requires reconciliation with our most intimate relationships. So we asked during this time, who have I offended? And I want you to think about this now and start preparing Make a list. Who have I offended? Who have I wronged? Who do I need to forgive? Uh, if some of you are familiar with the 12-step program, it's like steps eight and nine. You know, um, make a list of everyone you've wronged and with whom there's tension of any kind and make amends with anyone you possibly can. And I think the 12 steps got this right. They really did. This is a, a way to have a fresh, a clean start. It's a part of redemption. It's a part of healing. And we Jews are supposed to do this every year. Another way to conceptualize the 10 days is as if this was the time before your impending death. You know? You're told by the doctors, you've got 10 days. Settle your affairs. How do you, what do you do? I think that if you're wise, you make sure things are right with God. You know? If it were me, I'd recommit my life to Yeshua again. <laughs> you know? I would, I would pour my heart out and I would ask him to show me what I needed to do to make amends with anyone in my life and let them know how much I care for them. And I think that this is an apt analogy because in our high holiday drama that we walk through, this is the idea. We die 10 days later on Yom Kippur. So think about this. Do the people who you have in your life, in your closest circles... Do they know that you care for them? Are there people in your life that you need to apologize to? Your parents, maybe. Your kids, your family. Make sure things are good with your spouse. Sometimes people have disputes. We hear about them all the time. Family members, they last for decades. So-and-so, I haven't talked to them for 20 years. Now is the time to make it right. Forgive, and if reconciliation isn't always possible, sometimes people aren't here anymore, sometimes it's not safe, you can do your part in prayer. Um, practically, see Rabbi Rich, see myself, uh, other members of our Tefillah team, we can actually walk you through like prayers to forgive and to go through this together. But just think for a moment, is there anyone in your life where there's tension, where you feel, I don't really want to see that person, or they haven't talked to me, or there's bitterness? You know in your soul it will come up. That person who comes up is someone you should reach out to this year. And if, again, if you're unsure because of the complications of life, maybe talk to me and we can process what that might look like. So, so we move on to Yom Kippur. Now, what happens on Yom Kippur is that we go through a death. That's the whole idea. It's like everything stops. We, we, we stop eating so much and we don't drink so that digestion stops. That's the idea. We, we don't bathe on Yom Kippur. We don't anoint ourselves to make ourselves smell nice. You know, we're supposed to look a little off on Yom Kippur. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. We wear, you know, traditionally we wear white. I mean, you know, in modern Judaism we've loosened up a little bit, but like there's a sense of wearing white. Why? Because it's burial clothes. We wear burial clothes on Yom Kippur. Everything stops. 
And what we do at Rook here is we spend the day together. So we have services in the morning. And yes, they're long services. Yes, they're, they're sometimes painful at times, you know, all of this repenting and doing these things together. But that's, that's the point. When do we ever in life confront these realities as a community together, as a people together? It doesn't happen these days. Then we meet, we have Yitzchor, we remember those that we've lost together. We go sometimes take a walk together outside. We come back, we study Jonah. Studying Jonah is amazing. We have a great study. And it's just this beautiful tension between justice and mercy and reconciliation and all of these things that are happening within Jonah's soul. And it helps us. It helps us get through this process and through this day. And then, of course, we close with a service in the evening a final blast of the shofar, the books of life come to a close. And in our community, we have Zikron Mashiach. We partake of Yeshua's body. There's the first thing we eat after our fast, sharing in life together in him first, and then we go have a feast. And and then there's joy. So we die spiritually so that we can be reborn. That's the whole message of Yom Kippur. We live this out. And there's something about this isn't there something about death that's built into life? Vegetables and fruits die before they can reproduce again. Yeshua says no one can enter the kingdom unless he is reborn. In the Torah on Yom Kippur, the priest takes the goat and places the sins of the goat on the people, the scapegoat we call it, and then sends the goat off into the wilderness to die. And the principle is that our sins are so great that we are all, even the most righteous us, deserving of the fate of the goat. And yet, this innocent goat, this innocent animal that has no part in our sin, carries the weight of our sins into death. See, if you look at this, Yom Kippur is centered around Yeshua. Totally centered around Yeshua, His atonement. This is an image, it's a reflection of what Yeshua is in his fullness. It's made full in Yeshua. It draws its life from Yeshua and from what Yeshua has done. Because Yeshua is our quintessential scapegoat. He's our supreme sacrifice, the sinless one who himself will take on the sins of his, the world, you know. On his back. So Yom Kippur is a time to call out to his name. It's a time when we might look to the one who died in our place so that we might be inscribed in the book of life. Not because of our own merits and not because of our own deeds and not because of the checklist or whatever, but because of his merit and his deed and his life. So on Yom Kippur, it's, it's interesting. We repent. Yes, we enter into this. And Paul says this too, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I mean, this is, this is important. We repent. But really, in Yeshua, Yom Kippur, it's a day of God's greatest mercies. And so if you trust in him, this, what, what, it's, think of it like this. When, when your name comes up for judgment in our high holy day drama, that's when we hear the last cry of the shofar. But this is working towards a greater reality. When your name comes up for a judgment, even though you and I were deserving of death, Yeshua steps in and writes his own name in the book of death in place of ours. He died in place of ours. And then he writes our name in the book of life. And then next to our name, you might see penalty paid, sins erased, Yeshua's righteousness applied, eternal life on Yeshua's merit. This one's with me, he says. Inscribed in the book of life by Messiah himself. So let's wrap this together. We have Elul, where we search and prepare our hearts. We have Rosh Hashanah, where we open the book of life and make a strong calling for repentance. We proclaim God as king and judge. We have this 10-day pause where we make amends with God and with people in our lives as if we were approaching our own death. And then on Yom Kippur, we die so that we might have life again in Messiah. And then on Sukkot, joy. We celebrate as life in the kingdom of heaven should be. And it's interesting. The Torah actually gives us a commandment to be joyful 
Uh, I, you know, it's, it, we could talk about that for hours, but a commandment to be joyful on Sukkot. We have the first and the eighth days are these biblical no work days. Don't take off from work on the first day and then on the eighth day. And it's, it's interesting because if you really get into this, by the time you get to Sukkot, aren't you tired? I don't know. <laughs> I'm like exhausted after Yom Kippur. The day after Yom Kippur, I'm tired. And then I've got a few days to build a sukkah. In our case, too, because we build one in our house and then the Ruach one. And then we've got another day to take off and slow life again. And we go into this festival where we live outside and in the sukkah. But then here's the thing. When we get in the sukkah, we smell the etrog. Can you smell the etrog? Can you smell it? That lovely smell, the rich, the freshness of the fruit that we're told to rejoice with in the scriptures. He was, the Lord knew what he was doing. We smell the etrog and everything just washes away. It's like this beautiful, sweet scent. And I think that's the point. See, we miss the joy that we all crave in life if we jump back into regular life after the intensity of Yom Kippur. And God knew we needed a space to rest and to enter into his joy of redemption. He knows. So we go outside and we build a sukkah. We dwell in it for eight days. You know, I don't know. In our house, we like to spend a few nights camping there. We try to eat all our meals there. Um, If it's too buggy, put up a bug net, whatever, make it work. Uh, come over to someone else's house who has a sukkah, join us here, just, just find a way to get in the sukkah. Because it's like after we've stripped ourselves naked before God before, all that we can do is trust Him the way a child would trust her parents. And in the sukkah, we have no home, we have no roof. All the things that we've acquired in life, we don't use. You see? We're under the complete care of the Holy One. We have been reborn, and then we're invited to experience this new and fresh intimacy, joy, and goodness that comes from our heavenly Abba. That's the whole point. Sukkot points towards what life is really about after we've passed through life into, passed through death into life. Sukkot is about the kingdom of heaven. It's about entering into God's life. So, if we miss the high holy days, okay. But we miss this. And and I want us to see that these are not intended to be a few obligatory checkboxes or brownie points. You're not going to get brownie points from me. It doesn't matter like that. That's not the whole point. It's, It's not just a few services to check off or this or that that's convenient. That's like one act of the play because they all go together. The holy days are like this microcosm of God's redemptive plan for the whole world. We close and then we begin each year, we act out the story of stories. The end of this chapter of human history and the new beginning of the next, preparing for the real thing which one day every one of us will see. Now, touching this season isn't just in the realm of ideas. I'm an idea person. I get excited about ideas. But it's really found in the small things that let this high holy day drama run through your soul. Taking the time to allow yourself to draw near. Preparing in advance to take off from work on these days. Having to tell your boss or your employees or your teachers or whatever, I'm Jewish. These are the days that I take off. These are important to me, non-negotiable. That does something in our soul. It's preparing special meals with your family and Baruch Israel community, perhaps, for, for what might seem like Shabbat after Shabbat after Shabbat. It's singing Avinu Machenu together with your brothers and sisters in Messiah. It's hearing the shofar. It's going to the pond together to release our sins on Rosh Hashanah. It's calling that brother or that family member that you might not have talked to in 15 years and making things right. It's releasing that person who's hurt you most. It's repeating the Al-Chet on Yom Kippur again, and then again, and then again, and then again. It's literally falling on your knees as a whole community like we do in the Aleinu, bowing before the Lord. It's recommitting your life to walking with Yeshua as Yom Kippur closes. And then it's building a sukkah with your kids or someone else's kids, feasting in it, even camping out in it. 
having to explain why. The smell of the etrog, the feel of the lulav, and spending that time, time, to rekindle the intimacy and the closeness with the Lord that He so longs for us to feel together in covenant with Him. The holy days, the Moedim, bring us into what life in the kingdom of heaven is all about. So let us enter in together with, with joy. Shabbat shalom, everyone. And I'm going to call.